Okay, so this one's going to be about character generation. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a couple of options of what I'm looking at. I kind of enjoy that. It looks like our uh, little indicator is just going to be a yellow blob in the corner. Ah, oh, well. Once you've gained access to the stronghold, ooh, I get a stronghold, the menu can be accessed at any time from the central hub. That means we get a stronghold. Hey, I don't see my uh, lit lit ligator. Look at the biggities. Oh, well, I don't really need them, I guess. They look neat, though. Five wagons grope blindly for the path on a starless night, their master glancing ever upward to the skies for assurance that he is on the right course. A dim lantern, his only protection against the encroaching darkness. But the skies bring no comfort, shining no light, betraying no hint of what they know. The caravan carries travelers bound for the frontier hamlet of Gilded Vale, you among them, where a local lord has offered land and wealth to settlers from abroad looking for a fresh start. You have taken suddenly ill, sweating and shivering, and one of the other travelers signals for the caravan master to stop on your behalf. He pulls up just in time to avoid plowing into the trunk of a fallen tree that bars the way ahead. You will go no further tonight. Okay. So now we're going to do the character generation. Now, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to show you two t character sets. Uh, and I'm going to basically ask for your vote as to which one that you want me to do. And then I'm going to do that. So, the first one is going to be an elf. Let's see, the elves are the dominant race in Irglon Feth. This is, uh, the way that they describe this game is that it is uh, an RPG for people who like to read. So there's going to be a lot of reading and you're going to have to fucking deal with it because there's a lot of lore here and I'm really interested in it. Uh, but uh, basically, the elves are the dominant race in Irglon Feth and the white that wends are extremely common in the direwood and Aether. Uh Elves are known for their speed, their intelligence, as well as a common is commonly isolationist nature. nature. So there's Ierglanfath. It's a territory comprised of the forest southeast of the Baal River, populated indigenously by a group of loosely affiliated tribes collectively known as the Glanfathans, uh, and governed by a council of its six most powerful tribes. Ierglanfath is home to a large number of ruined Anguithan sites, which Glanfathans hold sacred. The ruins have been at the center of a number of large-scale conflicts with dry wooden colonists whose settlements often encroach on Glanfathan territory and who frequently seek to plunder the ruins for their relics. Uh, the Direwood is a colonial nation founded by settlers from the Aether Empire. Following a series of conflicts with the Aether, the territory became independent in 2672 AI and is now ruled by a duke whose election is overseen by seven earls that oversee the earldoms. Uh, they would start with plus one dexterity, which is uh, what you would think it affects action speed, attack spells, abilities, and everything like that. And perception is how quickly you can see traps and things and improves your deflection bonus and influes, improves your ability to interrupt. So I, we're either looking at a... See, distant advantage, okay. Uh, the difference are the Wood Elves, or the Skelterfoal, trace their beginnings in the far north of present-day Aether, and have migrated south through the forest of the continent, now covering it all the way south to the equator. They are also believed to have migrated across the sea to Ierglanfoth. Uh, well, physically... So physiologically identical to one another, Wood Elves from Aether are culturally different from those in Ierglanfoth, and consider themselves wholly different groups. So, we get... They would get distant advantage, and you could tell me which one of these two types of elves uh, to pick for this as well. So remember that part too. These ones get distant advantage uh, against any enemy that is more than four meters away, 
Uh, wood elves gain bonuses to accuracy, deflection, and reflex. Which is pretty obvious. Hit or miss, uh, deflect damage, and make your reflex saves. Now the Pale Elves, uh, it's unclear exactly how long ago the Pale Elves, or Glemfellan, came to the southern polar regions of the world, but they've lived there for approximately 12,000 years based on their continuous contact with Omawa, Omawa traders. They appear to be among the most stationary ethnic groups in the entire world, uh, migrating within the polar region, but seldom venturing far north. They are rare in all of the northern lands, and most people consider them exotic if they have ever even seen one at all. They get em and uh, elemental endurance. All pale elves have increased burn and freeze damage reductions. Now, damage, there are different types of damage. Uh, slash, pierce, crush, burn, shock, corrode, freeze, and raw. Uh, they are all, when you're looking at armor, the armor actually breaks down the damage resistance of those types. So, you, uh, these are the things that we want. This is the first character. a An elf, either a wood elf or a pale elf. And the class will be rogue. Rogues are ex what you expect. They're vicious killer feel killers filled for the brutality of their attacks. They can be found as often in dark back alleys as in the heart of uh, battlefield skirmishes. Though unpredictable and undisciplined, rogues are commonly used as shock troops or as a part of a surprise assault. Their withering attacks, breaking enemy ranks and morale, rogues tend to congregate in larger numbers in cities where they can be steadily employed as mercenaries or hired muscle. They get a sneak attack, which uh, if the opponent is afflicted, blinded, Flanked, hobbled, paralyzed, petrified, prone, shocked, stunned, or weakened. Uh, they get... What is it? Double damage? Doesn't say. Um, also with a player within the first two seconds of combat. So then they get stealth plus one and mechanics plus one. This is what lets you disable traps and things. Their endurance level is low. A um, little bit about this. You, you have endurance. Endurance is based on the encounter level. Your health is however many times your endurance. Every time you get damaged in combat, it reduces your endurance and it also reduces your health, but your max health is much higher. If you run out of endurance, uh, you fall unconscious. If everyone in the party runs out of endurance, you all die. Um, health can... Uh, endurance comes back to the maximum of your health every time combat ends. After that, you would have to, in order with your health, you have to actually rest in order to get it. And resting requires you to have camping supplies. So there's stipulations on that. It's not like in the old Baldur's Gate and Neverwinter Nights games, also made by most of Obsidian when they were called Black Isle. Uh, you can't actually rest just whenever because you finished a battle and now you want to get all your spells and shit back. Uh, your accuracy is very high. Deflection rating is very low. So we're going to be a rogue on this character. Uh, between the afflictions, you start off with the ability to get one affliction or the other. I'm going to go with Crippling Strike, primarily because you can do it two times per encounter. And it will make the target hobbled, which will reduce their movement speed. And it's a full attack and will hobble them for 10 seconds. The other one just makes them blind for 10 seconds. But I want to make them hobbled because I can do it twice per encounter, which is good. And then, of course, we're going to be able to dish out the points, probably looking at, like... Probably looking about like that. Somebody should write that down for me. Just kidding. So then we have a choice of what culture we are. So the Aider Empire is currently the most largest, the largest and most powerful force in this part of the world. It's centered around the equator and has a topical, tropical climate. Though the Empire has colonies in new, numerous areas of the world, Greater Aider is at its heart and houses of the majority of its human and elven nations. These things matter, for the record. Uh, let's see, that gives you a bonus to resolve. The Deadfire Archipelago, which is consisting of the nation of Nasitrak, dozens of Alma settlements, and hundreds of lawless pirate-infested woods, pirate-infested islands, and stretch along the northern sea. Deadfire is home to the Boreal Dwarves. Note this changes the weapons you get. 
Deadfire is home to the Boreal Dwarves, Almao, and a mixed variety of other races. The Deadfire Archipelago is the last stop for anyone headed east. A multitude of monstrous sea creatures infest the ocean beyond, making travel virtually impossible. It gives plus one dex. Eximital Plains, uh, located to the northeast of Ayrglan Floth. The Eximital Plains are a large expanse of fertile savannas that are extensively farmed by human and Orlin residents. The Eximital culture is one of the oldest in the world, and though one of the least imperialistic, having spread out for over the past thousand years, cloth armor and sticks. Old Vila, once the crown jewel of the southern seas, Old Vila is now crumbling rem remnants of an empire warring mage of warring merchant nations. Counting many humans and dwarves among their ranks, the old violent countries are still to be reckoned with and are proud of their rich cultural heritage. Uh, the Rawatai, which is ordained by the Elmau nation of Rawatai, the gulf itself is host to a number of nations, most of them Awama, Orlan and Dwarven. Though these countries are relatively young, they are some of the most advanced colonial settlements in the East. The Gulf is a land of riches and resources for those who can take them, and the entire coast is often pummeled by violent storms. The Living Lands is a mountainous region of the northern large northern island renowned for its diversity of plant and animal life. Its weather is unpredictable, and its ecosystems vary dramatically from valley to valley. The Living Lands are home to an assortment of races and a variety of colonial and independent settlements. Uh, and note, he starts with a spear. And the White That Wends. A large, cracked expanse of polar ice, the White That Wends is home to the Pale Elves and small colonies of daring explorers, outcasts, and adventurers. While virtually no plant life grows in the wild, in the White, it is home to many hardy species of dangerous animals that forage from the sea or prey upon each other to survive. Now, I want to point out something to you. These are the same, just in case you were wondering. I think that these don't change too. Okay. And then based on which culture you choose, you get different background choices. So that's also a thing. The rogue is going to be a drifter regardless of which one we choose, because I believe Drifter is in all of these. Okay. And of course, you get to choose your head and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. And then the voice. Okay. So... That's character one. Crap. Please let me skip the chat. Five wagons grope blindly for the path on a star. Character option two. And yes, the rogue would be a female. This is going to be a human, commonly called the Folk. They're the most common race in the Direwood and the Aider Empire, Old Vila, and the Violent Republics, which is a mercantile power and former colony of a larger, more ancient nation, Old Vila. Vilia. The Republics lie to the south of the Direwood and Ayr Glanfoth and are ruled by a duke elected the Consul of Seglia, Consuagli Asegia, a council of 14 dukes, including its five most prominent, the Duke's Belts. It's not as large as the Towering Amena. Humans are known for their strength and willpower, so you get resolve in mind. And it does not matter which one of these you pick. They are exactly the same. And we're going to be a cipher. So this is the other one. Recent discovery in the Eastern Reach, ciphers were once called Rishalgwin, or the Mind Hunters, by the Glanfothans. 
Ciphers have the ability to directly contact and manipulate another person's soul and psyche using an ally's or enemy's essence as the focus for their magic. Though most ciphers are still found in the Eastern Reach, practitioners of the techniques have spread through the known world. They are gaining acceptance over time, but are generally distrusted, especially by the uneducated. So, ciphers can directly target allies and enemies with powerful soul-focused effects. The, these powers cost focus, which they can build through the use of their soul whip. They get plus one stealth, plus one lore, and plus one mechanic. So they can pick locks. It's really interesting. I didn't know that. Lore gives general knowledge and stuff. And stealth makes you sneaky. Very low endurance, low health, average accuracy, but really high deflection. They're tissue tanks. So the two choices are going to be a rogue and the, uh, just to give you an idea of personalities, the rogue will be the smart aleck out for himself, doesn't care otherwise. The cypher will be very, uh, would be a brooding and yet kind character that would be concerned with other people's feelings. Uh, ciphers can directly target allies, so then we get powers. Let's see, we've got here, we get two powers. Really, we get two powers? All right. So we've got antipathetic, antipathetic field, antipathetic field. Let's try that. Uh, antipathetic field creates a toxin, toxic physical manifestation of the mutual antipathy between the cipher and their enemy target. Everyone, anyone caught within the path between the two will suffer corrosive damage. Requires ten focus, average speed. Uh, does a foe beam for ten to twenty-one corrode. Not bad. Uh, Eye Strike gives, obviously, the target's blinded, doesn't do any damage. Mind Wave, 10 to 19 raw damage. This one's toxic. Oh, it's a foe beam. Concussive Blast, suffering raw damage from trauma. Characters in a conical area behind the target take a fortitude check from being knocked prone. So only one person gets hit, everybody else falls over. Soul Shock briefly transforms the outer el shell of an allied target's soul into energy, releasing an electrical burst around them. Characters standing in the area around take a take shock damage. Whoa. 23 to 31 shock AoE. That's fantastic. Tenuous Grip. Makes them frightened. And Whisper of Treason Charm. So... Probably what we're going to do here is we would take the uh, either the Mind Wave or Soul Shock and then Whisper of Treason. So let's just mark these up right now. Uh, and then for stats, let's see, we're going to need Intellect, Dex, So we'll put that around there. Um, and again, it doesn't really matter where they come from. And this person, whereas the other one, like I said, would be a drifter. This individual would be either. Cat, you're driving me nuts already. Either a merchant. Or an explorer. So either lore and survival. Or lore and mechanics. So what I want you guys to do is... Um, all four of you that actually comment. Really people, can you like comment or something? It would be really great. Um, I want all of you to comment, tell us which one you'd rather have, the rogue or the, or the, uh, cypher. The rogue would be a female elf, the cypher would be a male human. Uh, and then let me know what, you, which one you would prefer, and we will go from there. Alright, have a good one, guys. Bye.